Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming today. Um, before we jump into the interview, we wanted to ask if you could give us an elevator pitch on what the Red Cross does. Oh, well, the Red Cross is uh, officially an auxiliary to the government, which means that we also help the authorities in times of crisis, because in times of crisis, you really need to scale up and you need uh, volunteers to help you, for example, with the people that aren't like severely wounded, with first aid, with blood donations, uh, with any kind of other task like helping people find each other or giving out food. And this is like officially what the Red Cross does. Mm -hmm. And it was founded a long time ago because it was helping armies with their wounded. Yeah. Because at that time there were no uh, medical teams uh, in armies and that's how it started. And then it moved to crisis help. So that's what we do uh, mm -hmm. officially, but we've extended uh, a lot. So we have really a, a role also in armed conflicts. Uh, so it's a diplomatic role. We can talk to all authorities and try to, to help processes we're neutral a neutral humanitarian and we do a lot of uh, activities around it like uh, also water sanitation uh, we call that surge when there's a crisis like now in Turkey and Syria we can bring in experts and set up systems to help people in need um, and you say people in need yeah. before the interview we showed some clips um, and your motto as well is to help people in need. With yeah. so many people suffering in crises around the world, how do you decide who are those most in need? Well, that's very difficult because, of course, we help people in need, but you cannot help everybody, and you're always having to make a selection of beneficiaries. Now, this is very important when we are in a crisis situation or in a situation of need, that we always do that selection ourselves on the basis of our own criteria, and we don't want anyone to influence that. Do you have a framework? That yeah, we work? have different frameworks to look at it. So we do assessments, and this is happening as we speak now in Turkey and Syria, to also determine what are the worst hit communities, what are the needs, and which families are the most vulnerable. And we have criteria for that. Before, for example, elderly people, people mm -hmm. with children, pregnant women, for for example, um, uh, single-headed households, those are, there are a lot of categories so we can look at who is most vulnerable. And uh, it, this is a very interesting subject because very often we have a lot of data of our beneficiaries and sometimes authorities are very much interested in those data but we don't share that. Yeah. That's really important Great. that we can make that selection on, base, on the basis of humanitarian needs. Yeah, and is there a case that you were personally a part of where you felt like you really helped someone in need? Uh, well, what I think is, is very beautiful to see um, that the Red Cross does, you know, food aid, things that really help people. But what I've also seen here in the Netherlands during, mm -hmm. during COVID, but also during uh, what is happening now, we have a crisis in our asylum uh, seekers system, but also we are hosting a lot of Ukrainian refugees, so we are helping with that. And I often see that the, the Red Cross volunteers and, and, and the Red Cross uh, employees are actually providing that little bit of humanity in the sense of listening to someone or just talking to someone. Because you sometimes when you're in a crisis situation, you become a bit of a number and you're being push, pushed into a system uh, and I think it's really beautiful when you can really have contact with someone for a moment and just have a conversation from human to human. Yeah. And I think those moments, they really touch me. Yeah. yeah. So it's when it becomes personal. It yeah, when it becomes personal you. and you can see the human behind the numbers and you can yeah. really give that little bit of humanity and see that person as a, as a proper person that has just lost everything, but is actually very a person like you and me. Yeah. 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 And to undergo these projects, a bit more about numbers, yeah. you Oof. need to fundraise. Yes. And we will now list a few methods where you can fundraise, and you will let us know whether or not the Red Cross uses them. You yeah. can say yes or no. Okay. Um, first, government subsidies. Yes. Uh, recurring donors. Yes. Wealthy benefactors. Yes. Partnerships with companies. Yes. Door-to-door -door sales. Yes. Grants, like from NGOs. Sorry, and grants, grants. Uh, yes, from foundations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, charity events. Uh, a little bit. And uh, targeted campaigns. Yes. 
And which one do you think is the most effective of these methods? Uh, I think uh, we have uh, our targeted campaigns are very uh, effective. Like now, for example, for Turkey and Syria, we can really fundraise when there's yeah. a big emergency. Uh, I think what is also uh, very important is the um, relationships we have with foundations that are recurrent donors and with companies that really help us. And the subsidies are also very important because they can really, you know, when the Dutch government gives us money to do things like, say, in Syria, for example, or in Africa, or in the Netherlands, those are the really the big rollout programs. But still, the, the, what we call the private fundraising is very, very important to us because we need to be independent and neutral, and we yeah. cannot be there that if all our money is coming from the government. So that other side of fundraising is very, very important to us. Um, and with that, can you always see who donates the money, like where the money is coming from? Yes, we can always see that, yes. Have you ever rejected donations because of where it was coming from? Yes, uh, sometimes we get uh, donations from companies and they need to be screened always. And we have to always see, you know, what their background is because, for example, yeah, tobacco companies or alcohol or, you know, you can't just... Uh, just take money from that if that goes against our objectives and we are also I haven't mentioned that in the beginning but we are also the uh, we we are involved in humanitarian law and we promote humanitarian law so we also have mm -hmm. to screen it if it's in according yep. in accordance with uh, those principles so, so who don't you take money from Will you refuse well I can't really name any. <laughs> we wouldn't take for example also from uh, uh, manufacturers of weapons mm. and that can sometimes be uh, complicated if a company makes um, uh, for example paints or certain chemicals that can be used also in defense uh, industries so we sometimes need to look at those things mm -hmm. and we can't take that money okay yeah. so sometimes you don't take money just from entire industries yes interesting yeah. Um, and we kind of already mentioned this, but you fundraise a lot of money through targeted campaigns and mm -hmm. donations for specific projects. Um, and do trending crises get more funding than other crises? Yes, and I think this is something we really need to give a lot of attention to because, mm -hmm. of course, when a, when a big disaster happens, like uh, the conflict in Ukraine, but also now the, the big earthquake, of course people want to do something, and it's relatively easy to fundraise yeah. uh, because everyone wants to do something uh, but there are also forgotten crises crises that are chronic basically and uh, or don't have the cameras there um, and we really try to fundraise for those as well cool. we call that unearmarked funding unearmarked fundraising that is very important for us uh, because we uh, we then we can decide where the money goes ourselves and we mm -hmm. can put it where it's most needed. So general, just fundraising for the Red Cross yes. that you reallocate. Yes, that we reallocate, and that's very important because we do need to also be able to uh, fund those chronic crises. Um, and I think one of the big challenges we have for the for for the future is that also with climate change we see the amount of uh, crises. Um, uh, increasing, increasing. So we really have to work more in preparation, in prevention. But it's difficult to fundraise for that. Yep. But that can really, really help a lot. I mean, now there's a lot of discussion that the way of building isn't uh, earthquake resistant in um, in in Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are uh, also a lot of things that you can do, uh, as it, you know, relating to to floods and droughts and maybe. You know, with the climate changing, with uh, um, uh, drought-resistant seeds, for example, there's a lot of things you can do to prevent famine, uh, but it's very difficult sometimes to do that because we don't have the funds. And you can't reallocate money that you raised to another cause? No, we can't. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes we can if we, for example, when we raised a lot of funds when the Hurricane Irma hit in the Caribbean and St. Martin, some of that money also went to uh, prevention for the next to, pr mm -hmm. you know, get stocks and do uh, awareness raising on how to prepare for hurricanes. Uh, so we can do that, mm -hmm. but then it has to be always, it has to yeah. be spent in, you know, if it falls under yeah, the same under, umbrella. Under that umbrella, yeah. And do you then have also a separate fund for uh, new yeah. emergencies that were not anticipated, say something climate-related or just a humanitarian uh, crisis that 
wasn't anticipated. Yeah, we do. We do have funds always that we can allocate when it's necessary. And we also have funds from the Dutch government mm -hmm. that in case there is an emergency and we meet certain criteria, we can allocate that money to certain disasters. Because there's also smaller mm -hmm. disasters happening in the world, like say floods in South Sudan. You don't yep. hear about it, but it's, it's really a disaster there. Mm -hmm. So it's imp important that we can also allocate money for that. Yep. But we cannot really do it like big, like we are doing in Ukraine or now in Turkey and Syria. Um, so that, that, that is more challenging, but we do do that and we do have funds for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And at this point, we'll have a small time for audience question. Uh, are there currently any audience questions in the house? Uh, the we see there, the gentleman. And yes, yes the mic, mic is coming, coming right. Ah, oh, perfect. Okay, my bad, my bad. <laughs> so a quick question. We, you briefly discussed about funding and about, well, the adequate and morality about accepting money from certain companies. There's a trend with uh, especially tobacco companies creating this type of shell companies. For instance, uh, I believe it was um, uh, Morgan. Uh, what's the name? JP Morgan created the Mission Window, whatever that is, to promote a better tomorrow. Would the Red Cross accept money from such companies that are essentially just... <laughs> No, I don't think we would, I, but at the same time, I think we always have to look at it very carefully when we, we are offered those kind of donations, because that can be a lot of money, and we can help a lot of people with that money. So it's, it's always a difficult discussion, but we do always look at it very thoroughly, and uh, if it's really a shell company for a tobacco company, I don't think we would accept it, but we would find that difficult, though, because we, we can do a lot of things with that money. But we have to be very clear about it. It's also about our uh, reputation, of course. Maybe we'll do one more here, the gentleman and gentleman in front. Yes, thank you. So um, you clearly do a lot of work around the world. But I'm curious, what exactly counts as a crisis to you that you need to intervene in? Is there a certain amount of casualties that needs to be reached? How do you exactly determine when you need to get involved? Yeah, uh, well, it depends a little bit. I don't, I don't really can, I can't really say it's this amount of casualties, or, but we um, we distinguish uh, between, you know, we have a national Red Cross or Red Crescent Society in every country in the world, basically, and um, a lot of these crises can be dealt with. Uh, by that national society. They don't need outside assistance. They might need some money from us, sometimes a little bit of expertise, but they can deal with it and themselves. And it really becomes a big crisis, really, when they cannot deal with it themselves anymore. And it really, they really need a lot of outside funding and they need outside capacity and expertise to actually deal with the crisis. Uh, this is really important. And then, of course, it has to be a crisis that really affects a significant amount of people um, and really disrupt daily life and also mean, it, it always means that people cannot really sustain themselves anymore. Because of course there's a lot of crises like floods and people can still manage. You know, if you have a little bit of money and you can see it coming, you can move your things to higher ground and you wait it out and you go back and you don't need anything. Uh, but when, when daily life is completely disrupted and people cannot sustain themselves anymore, then we call it a crisis and we call it very big when the, a national society can't deal with it themselves anymore. Yeah. All right, so maybe we'll get back to the interview yeah. now and then we'll have time for more audience questions later. Um, we have talked a lot about fundraising, but when it comes to actually spending the money, what is the most expensive aspect of humanitarian aid? Well, working in conflict areas, I, I, I mean, of course, the, the most expensive part is uh, buying all the, um, the, the food, for example, and the, and the logistics and the distribution around that. We also do a lot of cash programs now. When there's a market in the program and uh, in, the, in, the, in the area, then people are better off if you give people some money. They can buy the goods they need themselves, mm -hmm. and you still stimulate the local economy as well. But if there's nothing and it's a big emergency, then you have to get a lot of things in, so mm -hmm. the logistics and the distribution is, can be a real challenge. 
Um, another thing that is costly, but of course not as costly as, as actually the goods that you provide, is the security. This can be very costly, and I mean, it's really important that the people that work for the Red Cross are as safe as possible, which is not always easy in those uh, surroundings. So we do need that infrastructure. And is aftercare more expensive than dealing with the crisis immediately? So let's say this earthquake that happened right now, is it more expensive now taking care of all the damage, or will it be rebuilding the the damage it has caused? I think the rebuilding operation will be the most costly. Of course, now there's the crisis, there's the medical costs, there's the teams that come in, but I think to rebuild yeah. Turkey and Syria after this, that is going to be the, the big costly thing. And I don't think, I think we should not forget also the psychological trauma that people will have to live with for a long time. This really affects societies. And this is something that I've really seen in my work and I never realized so much because it's often seen as an extra psychological care. But the trauma that people experience when they lose everything, mm -hmm. um, it has such a huge effect. Uh, and I think that we as a Red Cross are working more and more also helping our, our volunteers. How do you help people when they are traumatized? And how do we actually work to build resilience communities again? Because this really affects people to a, to a really, really big extent. Yeah. Is that something new? The dealing with psychological trauma within it's, the Red it's Cross? It's newer. I yeah. mean, we, are, we have been doing it for a few years now, and I mean, other organizations do this too, that, so it's not new, but I think more and more it is seen as a vital part of, of care during and after mm -hmm. an emergency uh, that you really have attention to, to this, because when, for example, parents are traumatized, they cannot look after their children yeah. properly, and it has huge... huge Effects. I mean, you have to also be able to be able to get up and go and rebuild your life. And if you cannot find that energy, yeah. it can be very, very difficult. Yeah. And talking about helping with the Dutch Red Cross doing uh, work in various other countries, such as Mali, Yemen, Ukraine, and Syria. Why does the Dutch, Dutch Red Cross have so many projects in so many other countries? Yeah, now we, uh, it's important to realize that we always work with the national society in country. So in mm -hmm. Syria, we work with the uh, Syrian Red Crescent. In Mali, we work with the Mali Red Cross. So it's not that we do it ourselves. It's always, we call them with the host national society. And this I find very important because in that way we don't do a project and leave, but we work with them and we try and help them as well to strengthen their organization, which is more, uh, is better in the long term, of course. We are a relatively rich national society coming from the Netherlands. So we feel we also have that um, yeah, we feel we need to help our sister national societies that um, live in circle, work in circumstances that are much more difficult. And uh, we do that with money, sometimes with sending people. Uh, and we are very strong, and this may be interesting, we're very strong in uh, data analytics and digitalization. Because this is something also very important in humanitarian aid. Mm -hmm. How can you use data to provide more effective assistance? For example, if you can map an area and know where the vulnerabilities are, so you know where to go. How do you get this data? Sorry? How do you get this data? This data you can get, for example, by mapping. Mm -hmm. Just mapping areas or taking pictures of an area. Uh, uh, and, and, and For example, in the Philippines, we have been working on a model when a typhoon hits, mm -hmm. so we can already predict where it's going to land, and we can see what kind of structures are built there. So we can already estimate the damage to see what will be needed, maybe who needs to be evacuated and what needs to be done afterwards. And this greatly reduces the impact of disasters. So there's a lot of things you can do uh, before a disaster strikes. Then is this also some soft skills that you teach to these other... Yes. Yes, for example, Kenya Red Cross, I was there not so long ago, and they have a whole uh, uh, data and digital team, and they also support other national societies in Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's great to see that team, and they work with our digital team, and they get training, and they work together and see what works in the field to really use uh, data and digital tools in, uh, in providing assistance. And you mentioned uh, the Netherlands and Dutch Red Cross being wealthy, very well equipped and, and quite with 
some expertise in different fields. Is this the main reason why the Dutch Red Cross doesn't only focus on the Netherlands, but also on these other yes. regions? Yes, yeah, that's right. And I think uh, a lot of the uh, national societies that are uh, a bit more wealthy, they can fundraise. That way, I mean, we can fundraise for our own operations in the Netherlands, but like, say, the South Sudanese Red Cross, it's difficult for them to fundraise in their own country. So we want to help them in that way and support them in that way. And we can. Yeah. yeah. And, but you also have regional Red Cross organizations within the Netherlands. Um, why have those if they don't exclusively focus on their own territory, so apart from the one in Amsterdam, for example? Oh, yeah, because we are a grassroots organization. Mm -hmm. We have uh, 23 districts in the Netherlands, and uh, we have uh, volunteers that uh, work there and, and people that work on the ground. And this is very important for the Red Cross because we need to be everywhere. This is why also we can respond immediately now in Syria and in Turkey because it's our people and volunteers that of the Turkish Red Crescent and the Syrian Red Crescent, they are there and they can do that first yeah. response and then you know, other people from the rest of the country can come in and from outside can come in and help can come in. But we're everywhere and this is our strength <laughs> um, that we are actually also, we are local and global. Yeah. And um, you're everywhere, but you're also everywhere with governments. So uh, we wanted to ask, under which circumstances do you have to work with the government? Or is it always the case that you are working with governments? Yeah, actually you have to always work with the government because Basically, I mean, some, in some countries the government is stronger than in others, but in the Netherlands, for example, you cannot really provide, like we did a lot of uh, assistance during the pandemic and now with the uh, Ukrainian refugees, you cannot do that without the government, you are just not allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to say uh, where you can go and do you have the permit and, and what are the criteria, you know, so we have a very strong government. Of course, in other countries the gov government is less strong but as a Red Cross we always want to work with the government because also a lot of things that we do need to be taken over by the government eventually because we cannot mm -hmm. do it all the time, all the time. And, and it's actually uh, the responsibility of the government to do things in the long run so that's also important so we always work with the government but it's also a challenge because we are neutral yeah. uh, but we yeah. keep all channels of communications open um, and you have to work with the government, otherwise you cannot reach your beneficiaries, but to keep your neutral position, it requires diplomatic skills sometimes. And in cases of emergencies, what kind of tools do you use to influence the decisions of governments? Let me know if I need to clarify my question, but... No, I know, I, I can see what you mean. Well, the, the for example, in the Netherlands, uh, it is very important for us uh, to be seen by the government as the reliable partner in case of a disaster. Mm -hmm. And that means we have to have a seat at the table before disaster strikes, so we know how to find each other. And that is really important. And I yeah. think this is also why um, we keep diplomatic channels open and we engage in dialogue with all um, warring groups, for example, if there's a conflict area. Because when there are humanitarian needs, you need to have those channels of communication. Yeah. So I think that is very important for the Red Cross to always keep those channels of communication open so that when there's an emergency, we actually know who to call and we know we're there and people know us and we can actually help the people in need. So you have contacts to direct people in government that help Yes, you. yeah. Can you tell us like who someone like that would be? Well, here in the Netherlands, of mm -hmm. course, we have uh, we have contacts with uh, with different ministries. For example, for our food program, we talk to the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of Social Affairs. For the migration issues, we talk to the the the, the, the Minister for Migration, so actually yeah. a Staatssecretaris. Um, yeah, so with different ministries and, of course, the civil servants there, uh, we talk about, you know, what needs to be done and what do we see. We also have a lot of um, contacts in Parliament because we do always, when there are issues discussed that are of importance and we see that there are humanitarian aspects to this, we will also make our position known, uh, for example, uh, we have done that a lot in the asylum crisis, that we think that the conditions under which people are being sheltered here in the Netherlands are not always up to uh, standards. So mm -hmm. that kind of thing we will really advocate for. 
And do you ever talk to, for instance, EU officials or the UN? Uh, that is more uh, from the International Federation. Mm -hmm. So we, there's the International mm -hmm. Red Cross, and they do more the, the, the big international uh, bodies, the EU and the, and the UN. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have our, our contacts more at the government level. And has it ever been the case that the government re refused your advice or your help? Yeah, that happens, yeah. And even when they do accept our help, we also still always have to look at our independence and neutrality and does the work that we do uh, on behalf of the government often, does that align with our principles and uh, objectives? That's very important. So we need to be very aware of that. Um, and with that said, we would also like to dive into a recent case in the Netherlands. You yeah. briefly mentioned it in Terapel. Mm -hmm. uh, can you briefly explain what happened there? Yeah, so everyone who uh, wants to apply for asylum in the Netherlands needs to go to Ter Apel. It's very far away. It's about three hours away. I think with public transport, it might take you four hours. And you have to go there to register. Mm -hmm. And from there, you are taken then, once you're registered, to uh, an asylum seeker center. What has happened in the Netherlands, and is still happening, that there are not enough places. So, uh, you know, people that are in the centers and are... Uh, they, they should get a house to live in, there are no houses. So people that are in temporary centers can't go to the more permanent centers and the whole system is just blocked. Um, no one wants to take in or a lot of places don't want to take in uh, asylum seekers. So what happened is that Ter Apel became like uh, too full. Overcrowded. Yeah, overcrowded. Yeah. And it was really, really awful to see that happening. So uh, yeah, it was very difficult because you have to also think about the safety there and you want to advocate for a solution that's durable so you don't want to take over. And in the end, we had our humanitarian service point there, which worked very well. We gave uh, clothes to people, especially children that were mm -hmm. cold because it was already getting cold and people came in uh, summer uh, clothes. We gave some food, we did first aid and we also helped people that were very vulnerable and couldn't get in the door. We would take them and say, look, these people really need a sheltered place. I mean, it was really awful. It was really awful to see, yeah. And nine months before the huge crisis occurred, the Red Cross actually warned the government yeah. about the digital yeah. meeting situation. Yeah, various times. Right? But they didn't listen to you. Do you know why? Um, it's a very complicated issue because it's a whole chain of events. Uh, I, I think there's really, for this subject, migration, the political will is not really there no. to look for solutions. And, you know, there's not enough places. A lot of the cities don't provide enough places for people to go in parliament. People talk about just keeping people out, which is unrealistic because we have open borders within the EU. So it's just a subject that people don't really like to talk about. So it's difficult to find real solutions. And we've, mm -hmm. we've really sounded the alarm bell many times. Yeah. There's also a group um, that is not eligible for asylum, and that's a group of 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 that that of people also with psychological uh, problems, sometimes with addiction problems, and they cause also um, trouble. Yeah, problems, yeah. and and it's not always safe. So this also is bad for the for the image of these people because the majority of people are not there, but those those that group that is actually a special needs group kind of gets left behind and ended up in Ter Apel all the time. So it became very unsafe at one point as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in July you condemned the situation in Ter Apel, but since then we haven't heard too much about it. Could you tell us what's happening there now? Well, Ter Apel is now functioning because there are enough places now. Uh, we have warned since then that the places that people are staying are actually what we call crisis shelter places. People are maybe supposed to stay there at most a few weeks, but they have been there now for months. And it yeah. looks like they will be there even longer. And I have to tell you, there are big holes and there are people have like wooden plates, actually like walls. So basically you can hear everything, the light is central and you don't have a door, maybe a curtain, mm -hmm. and that's where you stay for months. So even though people are not outside on the grass, the conditions are still not good, but there are just no places. And what we try to do is really advocate to also say, look, we can look at new, uh, at places, what needs to be improved, you know, and help improve the situation. And this is 
also uh, something that we discuss internally a lot. Uh, we try to improve from the inside out to really work with cities, with lo local government and with the central government to improve these places. You can also say one time we're not doing it anymore, but then, you know, that is that might be something you can do in the end. Yep. But at the moment, we feel we can still work on on bettering those circumstances. So currently you're just working, the Red yeah. Cross is working on bettering yeah. the, cer yeah. the situation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How are you feeling about that? Are you hopeful <laughs> that it's going to improve? <laughs> Sorry? How are you feeling about that? Is, are you hopeful? I find it very, uh, very difficult to see when I see uh, families there with children and, you know, after they've had a very harrowing journey and, and probably a lot of terrible things happen to them yep. and their life is on hold. And, you know, the, the processes take a long time because this is another issue for the government. You know, the the, comp the, the organization, IND, that does the registration, they don't have enough people yeah. to do it. So there's a big backlog. And I think it's terrible to see so many people in limbo, mm -hmm. people who really want to contribute. And I find it very sad to see uh, yeah. that we that the world is like this. Yeah. But, you know, it's good that we can at least try and make it a little bit better. Yeah. We're going to move on a bit yeah. now. Um, the Red Cross focuses emergency aid and uses a certain framework um, to do that, and it's called the Emergency Response Preparedness Framework. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain what this means? Well, it's a framework that you can do, an assessment that you can do of your organization mm -hmm. to see how ready you are when, you, when there's an emergency. And it helps you see what structures do you, have in do you have to have in place. Do you have a crisis management plan? Do you have the right contacts with government or the crisis organizations of the government? Do you have a picture of the vulnerabilities of where you are working? Because that's, I mean, here in Holland, we have other vulnerabilities or possible yeah. disasters than in Mali. Uh, so it helps you go through that uh, systematically and then make, a, make an assessment. I have to say, we haven't done it for the Netherlands Red Cross. Oh, you haven't no, we done haven't it. done it. So a lot of uh, the organizations that, that uh, work in more conflict-prone areas, they have done it, but mm -hmm. we are talking about doing it. But we we have had actually continuous crisis the past three years, so we mm -hmm. haven't gotten around to it, because we had first the pandemic and then uh, Ukraine and then yeah. asylum seekers. And now, of course, we're very busy with the Turkey, yeah. uh, Syria. And yeah. has this framework been applied in Turkey? I don't know, I wouldn't be able to say. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably has, but I, I, yeah. I, won't, I don't know if they're talking about um, That said, you also recently started a fundraiser for yeah. Turkey and yeah. Syria. Um, do you get to say how this money is then allocated, or is it directly going to Turkey and then the local authorities allocate the money? Well, um, there's not the, t the Turkish Red Crescent and the Syrian yeah. Red Crescent, they are on the ground. Some teams from the International Red Cross have gone to make an assessment, and then the International Red Cross launches an appeal. Mm -hmm. And they say, we need, and the money, the money that is needed, they say now is 200 million for Turkey and Syria, and this is what we're going to spend it on. This appeal gets adjusted and amended as we know more, but then all the Red Crosses all around the world start fundraising, mm -hmm. and we give that money to that appeal. Mm -hmm. So basically, we distribute it through the International Red Cross. Does the Red Cross check whether these funds have been allocated well? Yes, we do. And then we, we work, of course, with the International Red Cross also mm -hmm. then to do that because they have people also for that mm -hmm. because it's very important during a crisis that you have information managers and people that do the bookkeeping and the, bookkeeping and the accounting because you have to account for everything afterwards. So you need to put those systems in place immediately. Mm -hmm. And in a case like this, um, like this earthquake, for example, the, the Dutch Red Cross reacted very quickly. Yeah. What is the decision process like in a situation like this? Well, um, if we see uh, what we can always uh, move very quickly because we immediately get information from the Turkish and yeah. Syrian Red Crescent. So already yesterday, early in the morning, we saw it was really big. We saw that there were already people on the ground and then we see that a lot of money is going to be needed and then we can launch our uh, mm -hmm. 7244 bank number and start fundraising because we know the appeal will follow and the appeal followed yesterday evening and it will be adjusted as we go along mm -hmm. uh, and we'll be sending in uh, different teams from different countries to help. Yeah. Um, 
maybe we'll move on from Turkey unless you have another question, but uh, in the world is deteriorating obviously right now. And in your opinion, what do you think the next big humanitarian crisis will be? In Europe. In Europe, let's say. But in the world as well, within the next five to ten years. Well, I think we will see more and more climate-related disasters. And I mm -hmm. think that's already happening. Heat waves. Mm -hmm. A lot yeah. of people die during heat waves. We are better at it now, also in Holland, because we take more measures. Uh, droughts, floods. Um, I think this is the major crisis that we're facing all around the world. And I think migration is also something that yeah. we really... Uh, we, we, I mean, it is also a, a continuous disaster, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is the Red Cross Netherlands doing anything or working to prevent these potential crises? Well, yes. Uh, on migration, we work a lot with the International Red Cross, of course, what we do in the Netherlands, but we really try and work for... Uh, for example, uh, safe migration routes so that mm -hmm. people don't have to take terrible risks to go migrate. Yeah. Um, in terms of climate change, we also host here in the Netherlands the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. Mm -hmm. And this was founded to really support the movement and uh, national societies all around the world. How can you prepare for climate change? What can you do? How can you organize your response? So this is something that we're quite big at. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we are doing, and I, I, we work together with the data team, mm -hmm. with the climate center team, is a lot more a prevention project, Much more, look much more at uh, what we call uh, response preparedness uh, and yeah. disaster risk reduction. So how can you reduce, reduce the risks how, what can you do in your environment and how can you build the awareness and how can you prepare better for possible disasters. So that is really uh, the core of our work and yeah. I think we really need to scale up more and more on that to be able to mm -hmm. deal with those things that we're facing. Do you get enough subsidies from the government to do this? We get quite, a, quite a substantial subsidies from the government to do this kind of work, for mm -hmm. example, in Africa. So we do. The Dutch government is quite willing to, uh, to help us with that because, mm -hmm. of course, a climate... And there is also quite a lot of money from the climate co the COP conferences to work with the countries that are most affected by climate change. And one of the things that uh, is very important to us, a lot of this money goes to big energy projects, mm -hmm. but we always say make, the people that get most affected by climate change are very vulnerable people, like for example, the nomadic populations of Africa. Yeah. They get mm -hmm. severely affected and they have contributed the least to this whole problem. And how do we as a Red Cross, because we are everywhere, mm -hmm. can make sure that this money that is meant for climate change also reaches these communities to build different livelihoods or help protect their environments. So we're really trying to leverage that voice. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do one last round of audience questions okay. before the end. Does anyone in the audience have a question? Maybe, maybe the girl in the front here. <laughs> and hi. Um, so a lot of the criticism for organizations such as the Red Cross is based on the belief of there being a lot of internal waste, such as like costs, administrative, uh, PR. Do you see that as an issue? And if so, how are you addressing it? Um, yeah, it is an issue. You always have to keep your costs down, but we and, and we do really strive to do that. At the same time, if you don't do PR and you don't do communication, you don't get the money either. You don't get interest for what is happening in the world, so you just need to do it. And also, I think that, that sometimes it is forgotten that actually helping people is also a profession. It's not something you just don't go out and start giving things away if you want to do it in a good way. It actually, you need professionals and you need security and you need um, uh, information and, and, com and computers and cars. So I think we need to tell the honest story that we do need to make those costs to, to uh, do aid well. So I think, yes, we need to be careful what we spend and um, uh, we need to be constantly vigilant and really on top of that. Um, I think sometimes we have to also spend a lot of money on evaluations and all kinds of uh, things in the name of transparency that actually cost a lot of money. It's also very important, but it costs, transparency also costs money because you have to employ people who write the reports, who do the accounts. 
uh, but we have to tell the honest story that we do need that to do our job well. So it's uh, it's two it has two sides to it. Yeah. Um, and we have another girl over there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So you did mention that the Red Cross is dependent on collaborations with the government and also gets part of its funding from the government. So in situations like right now with Terrapol or past situations like this, future situations like this, when there's political unwillingness, how do you deal with that to still solve issues, solve crisis? It's, it's a difficult one uh, because what you don't want to do, we have a principle which is called the do no harm principle. Because you can help, for example, say we would um, inter Apple say, okay, we're going to put tents there our, ourselves and we put it up very big and then a lot of people can stay there. But how long could we keep that up? We cannot fund that forever and it will be overcrowded, it will be unsafe. So are we actually helping people in the long run? So we always have to think ahead what are the effects of doing an intervention that might seem very obvious, but what will happen if we actually do that? What will happen in three days, in a week, in a few months? Are people not actually worse off? So this is always um, a very difficult decision. We also always have to make when we're doing emergency relief, for example, when you are feeding people after an emergency. Sometimes these people were already very poor and didn't really have enough money to feed themselves. But actually that is not, we are an emergency organization and we cannot do that forever. It should actually be the government that are, is looking after these people. There's, so there's always this, this, and you cannot say it's always A or it's always B. So it's a, it's a conversation, it's a dialogue, it's also an internal dialogue. And you have to deal with political realities, realities on the ground. But I think we always have to think very carefully about this do no harm principle uh, and that we are actually also not creating more problems in the long term for people. I don't know if this is a very clear answer, but it, it, it does show the dilemmas of our work. Yeah. And yeah. one last question. Thank you. So this question sort of builds off something uh, y'all asked earlier on and sort of building off of this young lady asked earlier, not ju just now. Was there ever a situation where you felt like you just didn't help at all? Like you tried to intervene and everything fell apart, or for whatever reason, you didn't reach the impact that you aimed to, um, that you wanted to make? Um. Well, to some extent, I, I, I find it, I'm struggling a little bit uh, uh, with, uh, example, different things going to my head. Um, I find the whole situation in the asylum seeker system in, in the Netherlands quite, quite challenging because we try to really advocate for that and for Ter Apple, but the situ situation is still not uh, resolved and the standards are still not up to par. Um, I think what I find difficult sometimes is that we do emergency aid and we can help people, but um, sometimes it's only for a short while and people go back into a very difficult situation. And I think this is very hard for me, for a lot of Red Cross people, uh, but needs can be so enormous. Um, and I think that this we will see also now with Syria and with Turkey, that we will be able to help people in the short term, but a lot of people are going to be even worse off than they already were, and then it's going to be very difficult for us to help them. And I think this is a difficult thing, because a lot of people say it's great that you work for the Red Cross, we can help people, it's true, but very often when you're in it, you, you're very much aware of the things you cannot do, or you're not doing. And I think it's human that we didn't look at that. So sometimes I find that very difficult. And when do you decide that you have to give up on a project? Like, how do you come to that decision? Well, it's, it's a lot of internal and sometimes external dialogue. <clears throat> we had, for example, a, a big discussion when during COVID, we did big food assistance campaign in the, the Dutch Caribbean islands, mm -hmm. uh, Curaçao, Aruba, and St. Martin, because they're really dependent on tourism and 
up. So, uh, like, there was an uh, unemployment of, of 70% of the population. Yes. So the, we did food assistance, but then, there, you know, it started picking up. And then, yeah, then there's a big deci decision to be taken. If you keep doing it, you're actually undermining the social security systems mm -hmm. that are there. Yeah. And you want the government there to take the responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult then to maybe some people are being left out. Yeah. Because we were also supported undocumented people. We tried to make, you know, um, provisions for that. But mm -hmm. then that's very difficult and you can only do that by a lot of talking and a lot of going over the options and can you phase out and can you maybe talk to other organizations that can do part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But we cannot take that over permanently. So, so it this kind of relates to that do no harm dilemma. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well today we have talked about the Red Cross, mm -hmm. but you were stepping down as director yes. at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to leave the organization? Uh, because it's a very intense job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can see it now again with this uh, crisis. And uh, I've had actually, uh, since I began, a year and a half after I began, I've been in continuous crisis mode. Mm -hmm. uh, so first the pandemic and then the asylum, the Afghanistan and Ukraine, asylum seekers. Now this, this is also big. Um, we had Beirut, Beirut in it as well. Yeah. Um, and I feel, uh, you know, also internationally, these type of jobs are usually like three years. And I feel that maybe after five years, it's good to take a little break. <laughs> Mental <Yeah>. health. <laughs> yeah, no, it is true. And um, that, that is really the reason. And I've, I've done, you know, I've had great experiences. I thought it was fantastic to be able to do this and, and I'm very proud of what we are doing and mm -hmm. have done but it's time for me to to look for a next uh, stage in my life yeah and in your next stage do you still look to continue working with NGOs or nonprofits, or will you be taking a different path maybe I don't know yet I'm going to take a short sabbatical to think about that mm -hmm. um, I am really uh, um, these these of course I, I'm working for the Red Cross because these kind of issues are the issues that drive me. So, and I studied here at the University of Amsterdam and I did international relations. So this is really also my passion. So I, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's possible that I end up in this kind of space, but it might be something completely different. I don't know yet. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah. uh, for the interview today and for coming all the way here. Thank you to our audience for showing up and being so active. Um, remember to check us out on our social media to watch this interview or our other interviews. And our next interview will be with Ernest Cowperts, the Minister of Health, Welfare and Sport, on the 23rd of February. So we will see you then. And if you'd like to register for our mailing list, please be sure to check with our friends at the back table and leave your Anyone email. Anyone with a laptop. So, yes, thank you so much. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.